Hello, welcome to uh, Dia's lecture. I have the pleasure of uh, introducing the uh, speaker today, Professor Norbert Krüger from uh, SDU Robotics, newly elected uh, fellow, or no, no, uh, chair of uh, Dia's. Uh, I'm Henrik Binstu, I'm the Dean of the Faculty of uh, Engineering. I am so pleased that uh, we have you now as part of Dias. Of course, I appreciate this is a scientific lecture, but it's for us also a uh, celebration that uh, robotics is now part of uh, Dias with a uh, very good representative uh, in Norbert. Norbert is, in the true sense, an interdisciplinary scholar. Right from the outset, he was engaged both in the arts and in the uh, hard STEM end. So he studied both philosophy and mathematics. His uh, PhD was in um, inspiration from biology in how the brain processes vision, if I understand it, approximately, right? And it was at the Institute for Neural Computation in uh, Ruhr University. And uh, Norbert has uh, also a uh, been a true internationalist, so uh, although you're German of background, you left Germany early, moved to, to Scotland, had a postdoc there, moved to uh, uh, one university in Denmark, had a postdoc there, to another, that happened to be SDU, that was a good choice, thank you, um, and uh, has actually continued both to reach out with international collaborations, but also collaborations across disciplines, and I think uh, the facts uh, show this in what you've engaged in. So one of them is to make it more intuitive for humans to interact with robots. Now that has an awful lot to do with mathematics, but it also has an awful lot to do with understanding humans. You see again, arts and STEM connected. Uh, cognitive and uh, computer vision is uh, central to what you do. Biologically motivated artificial vision but also the hard end of uh, industrial robots. I have to say, actually, first time we interacted many years ago, before I was even having any thought of being part of SDU, was in nuclear fusion, where it was about making a snake-like, enormous uh, robot, making it into the center of the nuclear hot, I mean hot not in temperature, hot in radiation terms, environment, and not being able to ram into or even slightly touch any of the very delicate issues. Um, but you've also been working on speech processing, mobile robots, welfare robots, and still theoretical neuroscience. So you have a true scholar, an interdisciplinary scholar, and one who really is going to be an excellent person to do what Diaz is supposed to do, namely connect the best across disciplines. Looking forward to your lecture. Uh, thanks a lot for, for this. Maybe too nice introduction. I hope I can fulfill all this, what, what has been said. Um, so my talk, or maybe we should close that here. Yeah. Um, has five topics. So first I want to define what is this talk about. I will talk a bit about robotics in Odense because many ideas, they probably have heard that uh, this is an important issue, but maybe don't know so many details about that. I will then talk about industrial robotics and robots that interact with humans. And then we do some reflections and predictions at the end. Um, robots in industry and public spaces. So I want to define basically what, yeah, what is the, the question of the talk. Um, so we would, in, during the talk, we will look at very different kind of robots. So this is a, these two robots they are actually built in, in Odense. So it's a classical industrial robot. This is a mobile robot. And two rather big companies that have been established in the last decades produce them. Then you see robots. So this is a robot that is supposed to lead elderly people to, from A to B. This is a robot that is supposed to grasp, to to take water from this fountain, put it on, <coughs> on a tablet, and, and then uh, give it to, to elderly people. And this, I would say, is a science fiction robot. But what I want to say is, OK, why, what is difficult to make these kind of robots work? And also, I want to, dare so, to do some predictions how robotics could develop in, in the next 10 years. So let's start 
with industrial robotics and what kind of ideas people had when this started. So this started in, in 61. There was a Unimate robot uh, worked on, on, on General Motor assembly line. Uh, then uh, the first industrial robot, uh, robot with six degrees of freedom. So they look like this usually. Six degrees of freedom means you can reach every position and orientation in the workspace. Uh, so these robots had a big influence, so they basically replaced in the begin beginning repetitive movements in mass production and they, they led to a high degree of prosperity in, in different countries. We can produce things better, faster, cheaper. These assistive robots or interactive robots, this started later, maybe around 2000. It's probably not so, so really clear to define. Just a def definition, what is an assistive robot? So two definitions of many. An assistive robot is a device that can sense, process sensory information and perform actions that benefit people with disabilities and seniors. So we have the sensing, understanding what is going on and then doing reasonable actions. Another definition, a social robot is an autonomous robot that interacts and communicates with humans or other autonomous physical agents by following social behaviors and rules attached to its role. So it should even have an understanding of, uh, 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 of what is reasonable in a, in a certain context. And there have been large ex uh, expectations for these kind of personal robots or assistive robots. So this is a prediction from uh, Bruno Messonnier. The industry of personal robots will be in the 21st century, what the automobile was in the 20s, in terms of economic growth and social change. So that's, of course, a, a very big statement, and many people associate these kind of robots that are human-like, are socially intelligent, can act perfectly, and, and so on, with these kind of, of, of personal robots. Uh, but this guy, he is definitely a bit biased because he owns a company that, that produces uh, humanoid robots. So, uh, and I, 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 I want to look at this prediction during the talk, basically. So what, what can we expect, where are the issues, and so on. Okay, let's look, what have people thought in the 60s when the whole thing started? So, and I, I give three predictions. So the first prediction is from Norbert Wiener. He is the founder of uh, cyber, Cybernetics. Uh, and he said it is perfectly clear um, that uh, automation will produce an unemployment situation in comparison with which the depression of the 1930s will seem as a pleasant joke. And he made this prediction in, in 1950. Um, and there is something right here. So what you see here is the number of robots employed uh, in, in American uh, uh, industry, and here's the number of jobs in production which go down. Um, but on the other hand, it has not led to higher unemployment, to the opposite. So the society has changed. So I think that's probably not what, what has happened. Uh, another prediction from Elise Mary, uh, Mary Hilton, she is much more positive about robots. Um, and she said, in the area of cyber culture, all the plows pull themselves and the fried chickens fly right onto our plates. And uh, also, she has a point. What you see here is the number of hours an American worker needs to work to get one chicken. <laughs> and it goes down from three hours to 20 minutes, and it stops 2,000 here. So today, it's probably even better. Yeah? So this happened um, in, in this way. So it, things become cheaper. In, in when, you, when you think about uh, paying it in, in work hours. Then uh, Nikita Khrushchev, so he was the leader of the Communist Party uh, at some point. Uh, you remember maybe the shoe episode, uh, and it's not very clear whether it was him or not. I, I don't know, I don't want, but he said, automation is a great thing. It is a means how we will get rid of you capitalists. Uh, and there you might doubt whether that has happened. On the other hand, you have seen the strangest comebacks in history. So the question of the talk is, 
what role could robots realistically play in public spaces in the near future? And I can already say now that the media image, is, uh, media image is much more positive than what reality says. So I think that should become a bit clearer. And I will talk about underlying scientific problems in robot grasping and in human robot interaction. But before I talk about it, I want to tell a little bit about robotics in Odense. It's also called Robot Valley Odense. But now there are many other cities that also are called Robo Valley Dresden and so on. So it's a, um, but uh, I, I think in Odense we, we really have a point to, to make this statement. So there was this uh, shipyard, the, the Linde shipyard, uh, that closed in 2012. But in 1997, they started the Maersk Institute. They started an institute that is concerned with robotics, and the idea was that the robots should help to stay competitive. And maybe it has even extended the life of the shipyard for, for more than a decade. Um, but at some point, also the shipyard, they, they needed to, to close down. But what ha has happened, since in Odense now there were researchers that were uh, working on robotics, new companies appeared. So the two most known companies is the Universal Robots. They produce this kind of robots, so industrial robots, which are able to, to cooperate with, with humans in a better way than the, the robots, these similar robots before. And this is uh, Mia. So they produce this kind of mobile robots. And, uh, uh, Universal Robot has now more than 1,000 employees. EMEA has more than 200. They have been bought by a really great amount of, of money from an American company, but they, they still do their main business here. And in addition to that, a lot of other applications and companies have uh, been uh, um, addressed. Um, so here you see some applications that, that, that are addressed in Odense. Uh, we talk farming, we talk probably medical uh, uh, processing here. Uh, we have also now drones, uh, uh, a drone center here that is very successful. Uh, of course, production, uh, large scale uh, um, construction, and so on. So, uh, and in terms of, of workforce, so we have 400 robotic companies in Denmark, most of them in Odense, I would guess nearly uh, 14,000 people working there, uh, 10,000 here in Denmark and, and 4,000 abroad. So this is really for Odense a factor. And also when we go to the Linde shipyard, there seems to be uh, soon new life. Uh, and it's very much Christian Schlatter who is behind it. So instead of ships, we, uh, the idea is to build large scale constructions by means of robots. So also here, it, it has closed down, but now there seems to, to be new life through the investment that, that has been done uh, uh, in, in 1997. So I think that's pretty much a success story. And now for Odense, a big economic uh, uh, part, actually. Um, now I talk about dexterous grasping and, and actually how to avoid it. That's a bit a longer uh, history um, where we made some experiences from which we learned to try to tackle the problem in a very specific way. But when we, let's say when we want to grasp an object, there are at least two problems. The one is where is the object? And the other one is how to grasp it. And often when you grasp it, you want to do something afterwards, so you grasp it for a specific uh, purpose. Um, a question is also what kind of gripper to use. And what we will see is, or I, I, I will come back to these issues uh, later. So, so, no. so, uh, so the, the one thing is you, you need to say where do you want to grasp the object. The other one is what kind of gripper you use. Often this is done in industry by manual design. We made some attempts to do, the, to do it by hands that are more human-like, um, but we learned that basically this was very difficult to do, and now we designed it by simulation. And this story I will 
uh, talk about. But the first thing is, um, in computer vision, we want to know where the object is and what orientation it has. So we have a camera. Uh, we have a camera here, and we want to have the pose of the object. And also, computer vision is a very uh, uh, young science. So I think the first cameras, they appeared around uh, 1963. Um, pretty much to the same time where also robots actually, the so industrial robots appeared. You could think about vision as a, or let's say that's what people thought about vision in the 18th century. So you see, so they had the idea at that time, uh, so-called phre uh, phrenologists, that in the brain you have different areas, and these areas, they are devoted to different purposes. Um, and these purposes uh, were wisdom, love, will, there was something, dignity, and so on, and there was also light. So they thought we need to have um, an area that is concerned with light, but this area is pretty small, probably. Why is it small? Because it is so easy for us. Uh, and it is between the eyes because it is, um, uh, it, it's then there are close connections, probably. Nowadays, we learn, we, we know more. So when you think about the cortex, you can think about a piece of clothes that is scrambled together, and you can kind of flatten it. And when you flatten it, it looks like this, and everything here, all these areas, they are concerned with vision. So more than 50% of your cortex is concerned with vision. Um, and this says that it is probably not an easy problem. So evolution has actually put masses of resources to solve the problem. What we tried at some point is, so my idea was, okay, I want to learn from the human brain how to develop algorithms. And maybe I also want to understand the human brain by understanding the, the problems that are involved with uh, solving the task. And what we tried here was, we tried to explain to engineers the two days knowledge about the neurophysiology of the human cortex, or about the visual cortex. Um, and one thing that is clear when we look at the visual cortex is that it is organized in a deep hierarchy. That means that the different levels are organized in layers, and the information goes in the first place from one layer, uh, level to the other. You can actually measure it by latency. So from the, info inf uh, the information uh, arriving here, it takes approximately 10 milliseconds to go from one level to the other. And we have in total maybe seven, seven levels with, with different areas. And today it is actually these deep neural networks that have the biggest success in, uh, uh, in computer vision. So we have uh, a lot of stories where we have algorithms. So within 50, 60 years of development, when we say the first cameras were around in 1960, um, where we have a better performance than humans, breast cancer, for example. We had the example that in China, there was actually a guy who was a, a criminal, and he was kind of caught in a, in a stadium. So face recognition is so good that we can actually detect people among one billion of people. So something that humans never could do. And a lot of success is actually related to this kind of deep learning. A problem that is connected to vision is when with a camera we want to find the pose of the object, we don't get the correct pose. What we get is an estimate of the pose. And we are interested in coding this uncertainty that is connected with that. And that has to do with grasping. For grasping, it is very important, or for many tasks in, in grasping, it is important that we know where the, object, where the object is, 
when I've grasped it. Yeah? And when the visual pose is uncertain, so when it is not there, where, when the object is not there where I have estimated it, but slightly off, then I don't know the pose of the object in my hand. But this uncertainty cannot be avoided. And what we do, we do this kind of cutouts in our grippers. And these cutouts, they make sure that although I have grasped the object imprecisely, that the objects align to the pose that I expect. Yeah? And what we often need is that this alignment capability of the gripper is larger than the uncertainty of the vision system. Because then the gripper can compensate for it. Yeah? In this way, the uncertainty, so a visual quality, can be linked to a quality in, uh, that is connected to the, to the gripper. Here you see a number of objects, and for many of, uh, used in industry, and for many of these objects, you need to design a very special finger, which, for example, allows to align the object, also to grasp it in a way that you can perform the next action. This is a very costly process. It can take up to weeks to design the right finger for something. And it is very clear that the same gripper cannot then grasp different objects. Another alternative is dexterous grasping. An example for a dexterous, a dexterous gripper is our hand. So here you see that our hand is able to realize a lot of different grasps and by that is able to grasp a lot of very different objects for different purposes. So these kind of grippers have also been developed in industry or well, let's say in research. Here you see two examples. That's a shadow hand. It's a five-finger hand from the topology very close to the human hand. This is a hand where we believed at some point it is more reliable than the shadow hand. It is, it is not so, so complex. And in a, in a project that we did, we actually applied this hand for the task of assembly. I will show a video in a minute. The assembly of these objects. Um, and you see here how the shape of the gripper changes depending on the object. Um, and I will now show a video, and it is very much. No, where is this? Oh, here it is. It's it's very much uh, uh, Rajit, who has coordinated this process that we got this demo working. So what you see here is so the visual pose estimation is kind of okay here. So this is uh, this is done. We have a planner that says now you should grasp this object in that way. And here you see now basically how this uh, um, crane field benchmark is assembled. And you see that for different kind of objects, the shape of the, uh, uh, the hand changes. So that was a quite difficult object. So now there come some simple, it's called pack and hole actions. And there where Rajit always became very nervous was the next object. And also, at least in this video, it, 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 it worked. And then uh, it's a, uh, at the end, it's, it's a final plate. We knew at the review that it works in 50% of the cases. And of course, I mean, there were four demos. The first three demos we were very sure about, so no problem with that. Um, uh, and then, of course, when we had the, the, the review the first time, it, it, it didn't work. But then we did it the second time, and then it worked. And we were enormously proud what we achieved. And we didn't touch this hand again. Because we were aware of how complex that is. 
For industry, it's not good enough when something works 50% of the cases. It needs to work 10,000, 100,000 times. So basically, we said dexterous grasping does not really work for us in a way that it is stable enough that we can make use of it. One issue is we, we try to grasp this object 1,000 or 3,000 times. That's how the finger looked after that. Stability. Uh, another thing, and that's a bit more subtle, is so here when you did this part here, then um, you, you touch the object and then there was a slip. That means the pose of the object has changed. And then it is very difficult to make the follow-up action. So we see basically that the control of these systems was so difficult that so they were not stable, there were, not, uh, there were no repeatable information, they were not reliable, and they were much too complex. And we said basically we don't, we don't want to, to work with that anymore because industry uh, uh, asked for something else. Hendrik just told me that he tries now again, uh, uh, but on a very low technical readiness level. So I'm uh, curious what, what, what uh, might come out there. Um, when we do pack and hole actions like this, you want to insert this here, it is very important to be that we know the pose of the object. And as I explained before, a way we achieve that is basically by these kind of cutouts. And in this way, we can align the object. And even if there's visual uncertainty, we can deal with that. OK, we basically got back to the approach that we want to design individual fingers for individual objects. We did that by parameterizing fingers and then testing it in simulation. So here you see in simulation we can actually, uh, we can do a lot of tests, maybe 10, 100 tests in a, in a, in a second. We make sure that uh, the difference between simulation and reality is not too big. We test different kind of grippers with different kind of cutouts, and then at the end we take the best. So basically what we do is what we have done before by manually designing it, testing it in a work cell and so on, we now do in simulation. And hoping that because we can do many more tests there that, that we, we can speed this up. Okay, let's reflect on that. We said for many objects we need individual fingers. This is costly and makes automation harder. Dexterous grasping appears to be a solution. One hand can grasp very different objects, as we see here. However, there are issues. No artificial hands with the same qualities and human hands are available. The tactile sensing doesn't work. Stability, robustness, repeatability. There are difficult control problems. With a colleague of mine, Ole Doris, I wrote an article some years ago, Five Reasons Why Robots Won't Take Over the World. And it's an article in the newspaper, The Conversation. It is actually, as far as I understood it, paid by universities, and they help researchers to formulate their research in a way that it is understandable. So I enjoyed very much the cooperation with this guy there. So I think that was a very good investment. And also, you can read politics and so on. So it's really a, it's, it's a very good newspaper, in my view. And it's for free. Um, we mentioned five reasons why robots will not take over the world. And the first three were actually connected to there's missing hardware in terms of the hand as such, in terms of the tactile perception, and the complexity of the control. So this is a real limit also for robots in public spaces. I have difficulties to imagine that robots with hands will appear in public spaces in the next decade or, or longer. So there are fundamental issues on the way. Um, now I want to talk about robots in public spaces. So we go a little bit more to the right side. So you see here, this is a robot uh, uh, in, in a project we performed here. This is a robot we bought, and I'm not sure whether we, in retrospective, would buy it again or not. Uh, so here's the idea, there's a dispenser, the robot is going there, it has this kind of dexterous hand, uh, uh, and it takes the water out of it, puts it there, and, and serves them, them people. So there are good reasons for believing that they 
that these kind of robots are probably completely unrealistic. So we were looking how to go on with research. What we knew is that these MIA robots, these kind of mobile robots, they are already in, available in industry. Okay, we also knew that this kind of dexterous grasping is uh, 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 it's not realistic. Then we looked like a task here. It's, it's changing of compression socks. So we wanted to do something in the elderly care domain. This is a repetitive task. Uh, uh, personal does not like it because it's very straining. 90% of the people in an elderly care home, they have compression socks. It would be just nice. When we looked how this is done in an elderly care home, we immediately dropped it. We saw basically first the fine tactile information that was required, but on the other hand, the eye contact, talking in between, and so on. So it was not, it was not possible in terms of the hardware. It was not impossible in terms of the complexity of the interaction. And this I will um, dwell on in a, a bit in the, in, the, in the last 15 minutes of my talk. So this is unrealistic. Here you see some robots in the welfare domain. And I only want to point to some. So here, for example, it's a robot for Parkinson patients. You, you might not want to call it a robot because it's so simple. Um, the, uh, there is a little motor here. And uh, so the tremor of, mark, uh, of uh, Parkinson patients, the idea is that this becomes compensated by this motor here so that the end effector actually is more stable. A very simple machine, but maybe very useful. You have something like Skype on wheels. You have wheelchairs that transform into, into beds. This is also a system that has been developed in, uh, in Odense by Blue Ocean Robotics. So it's for disinfecting uh, uh, rooms. The power robot is for um, interacting with, uh, uh, with people, particularly with dementia. It is said that this uh, calms down the people. There are a lot of articles that uh, show that. But all these articles are together with the company that is actually developing the robot. My experience, so uh, uh, then, uh, uh, communities, uh, municipalities in Denmark bought this device, and it is basically not much used. So you see much simpler robots, and once they become more complex, then actually there's a risk that they might not be usable. On the other hand, there is a societal challenge that people become, we have more older people, we have less people in young age that can take care of the elderly people. So there's a, there's a large pressure or hope that robots, uh, robotics uh, can help here. And uh, together with, uh, with uh, Leon Bodenhagen, we wrote the article about what is the state of the art there. And what we did was we looked at different areas. So we looked at the areas of uh, rehabilitations, assistance, telepresence, manipulation robots, and so on. And we looked, so that's uh, the y-axis, and the x-axis is uh, the technical readiness level. The technical readiness level means how mature is the pro uh, pro uh, 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 this product. One means it's just the idea. N nine means it's, um, uh, it's a ready product. And we wanted to see how far are we in these different areas? And I want to give you some glimpses there. So there are fields where there is a need, a market, and also a product. Rehabilitation is one of them. This kind of logistic robot, similar than the MIA robot. So this has been used already for quite a while, even in areas where humans are there. These robots are still very stupid in some way. So when they meet a human, then they just stop instead of negotiating with the human how to, how to solve that. But anyway, uh, also cleaning robots become more and more autonomous. So here I would say it's very clear that something will happen. So this we put on green. Then there are telepresence robots. Uh, uh, they are used, for example, in, 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 in hospitals. It can also go wrong. So that was the story of a, of a person of, a, of a, a doctor who told 
an elderly person that he will only die two or, uh, will uh, live two or three days longer. And that's maybe not something that you want to do via telepresence. And, and what was even worse there was that he was uh, deaf on the one ear and it was her grandchild, his grandchild, that understood that and needed then to explain this to, to the grandfather. So you can imagine that probably the hospital has changed policy afterwards. Uh, but what you see is you see kind of linear growth here. And these are my child diseases. This happens, you learn from that. Okay, so there is also a green area. Then there are robots where there is a need, a product, but no real market. And there one needs to be careful. I want to give two examples. So the one is uh, this, this is a wheelchair where you can stand up. There are only advantages there. You can talk with people on, on the same height. You get blood flow through the, uh, uh, through the legs. You can reach out in your kitchen and so on. It, it is, works perfectly. But in Denmark, you don't get it because it costs 25,000 euros. So it's a society that makes kind of a decision. You don't get it. I hope in five, 10 years, that will be different. So price is an issue. And here, this device, it's, it's 200,000 something. And also, sometimes you, you have robots that just don't work. Um, so here I made, uh, we, we made a yellow. Then there are other examples, um, these kind of Alexa devices, you have kind of a linear growth. There have been attempts to... This is your house. This is your car. Yeah. This is your toothbrush. These are your things. But these are the things that matter. And somewhere in between is this guy. Introducing Jibo. The world's oh. first family oh, why robot. Does, why does Say hi, work? Jibo. Hi, Jibo. <laughs> well, that's really Jibo funny. helps everyone out throughout. Uh, it's not very heavy. Okay, I don't know. No, I don't want to lose too much time. I want to say, maybe you got also, uh, already from the sound something. The idea is you have Alexa with an embodiment, and you can make pictures, you can kind of just talk to him, order me some pizzas, and he tells you about the uh, kind of things that, that, uh, that will happen over the day and so on. So it's kind of a little friend that, that helps you. Um, there have been three companies that developed these kind of robots, and they all basically went bankrupt. Although there were huge investments made there. And the reason that I see is that probably they didn't get the interaction right. It was not so smooth then they presented it in the videos that were all well cut and kind of engineered in some way. So here also I would put an orange. Then there are robots where you have they're very specialized and uh, solve one particular task that was, for example, uh, also kind of a robot in, in Denmark that helps you to get off your trousers. And it probably fulfills the, surface, uh, the, the purpose, but if you have problems to go to the toilet, you have probably many more problems. And if you can't solve them, then this one robot doesn't help you a lot. So that probably was also a failure. And we talked also about uh, robots with hands, where, where we said, okay, here dexterous grasping is really an issue. At the end of my talk, I want to talk about two projects we have been working with in the welfare domain. And it is, uh, all this work is done together with Leon Bodenhagen, who actually leads the welfare group in, uh, uh, in, in our section. Uh, so it's the Resicare project and the Smooth project. The Resicare project, it's now in, in its last uh, uh, month. It was a very nice project because we even did not promise any kind of specific robots we want to develop. What we said is, we want to investigate the area and develop 20 good ideas for robots. So that was our, and, and five of them we, we developed further. And I only want to, and that was kind of a, a thorough analysis, uh, analysis of the processes in, in elderly care. And what came out, one of the ideas was Bibo, the augmented drinking cup. So this is supposed to be used for people, uh, or demand people, they often forget to drink. 
So it's to remind these people. In elderly care homes, it is done often by nudging the people. The staff says, oh, please drink something, or you even put the glass in the hand of the person. Um, we wanted to make a device that moves. He has a little motor in it so that some vibration occurs, and then it kind of rotates around the own axis, that blinks, and also makes a little sound. And it generates actually a very nice pattern through, through this, and I hope that this video now works. You get an idea about there's a subtle sound. You don't want a cup that all the time says something, and then you have five of these cups on the board, and then you get completely crazy. Uh, so it, it needed to be multisensorial, and it needed to be subtle. And um, what we did, we went into an elderly care home here in Odense. We spent there four weeks. Javier, is that correct? <laughs> and we had, in this time, 60 hours observations. We created a lot of data. Long story short, we could show that, in average, we could increase the water intake by 30%. And at the same time, having a reduced nudging. So that was quite a success. This is a kind of robot. You, one might discuss is it a robot or not, that uh, could be used in elderly care. A more complex device we worked on in the Smooth project. Here, we started with these three application areas. We basically started with the drawings. So it was guiding, logistics, and it was uh, uh, offering of, of water. Uh, we developed this robot. We were rather careful how the robot looked like. We didn't want to have a human-like or an anthropomorphic look. We didn't want that our robot gets confused. It should become clear that it is a machine. Uh, and so we found some kind of compromise. We worked with some uh, humanoid features like eyes, uh, but in general, the machine or the robot looked like a like a servant, like a machine. So these kind of confusions could not take place. We uh, solved these uh, for uh, use cases, and now I'm... A robot serving water is uh, quite important because it can help people in this function. So uh, maybe a service personnel or a care home personnel are quite busy with other tasks. I try. I hope I don't mess it now completely up. No, I, 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 I better tell the story, also in terms of, uh, of time. Um, so this robot was supposed to offer drinks to people. And we, for that, we needed to address a large number of problems. So first, you have vision problems. You need to detect the people and so on. Uh, you need to do human pose estimation, gaze estimation. So you need to find out where is the human looking at. You need to do navigation. You need to talk to the human. You need to understand the scene and what the human wants to do. Um, and you need to develop behaviors that adhere to social rules. And this we address to a certain degree in this uh, pr uh, project. And I want to go into uh, problems a little bit uh, deeper. So one is when you want to offer something to a person, you need to come close to the person. You need to enter the personal space. Um, and this is not convenient for people when a machine comes close to you. One way to make it easier is you give little signs. You blink. When the person is looking at you, you blink. Um, and then you indicate, okay, now you want to move closer. And we, we could show that we could actually improve the acceptance of these kind of behavior. So just one of the sub-problems. Another sub-problem is a socially aware navigation. So if people are, are standing together, often they form groups, and it would not be very convenient when the robot is just going through the groups. Um, so that means you need to understand the social context. And then you need to plan the movement of the robot accordingly. And in addition to that, there are many other problems 
to be solved in human, rom uh, human robot interaction. And it's not only that these individual problems need to be solved, also they need to play together. You need to get the timing right, and so on. And this makes it a really hard problem. And that was basically the, the, the fourth reason all and I defined as the reasons why robots won't take over the world, the complexity of human-robot interaction. I'm coming now to the end of the talk, reflections and predictions. So there are expectations and fears connected to, to robots. So it's the fear that uh, the robots take away the, the work, the expectation that maybe you can even replace your, your partner by a more convenient machine that is not so much doing things you don't want to do. There, there are concerns about uh, uh, robots in, in, in military. Um, and these are partly right and partly wrong. My guess what will happen in the next 10 years, or uh, in, in, in the next years, is the following. What we have now is already a robot that's doing transport. So here is, is, is a, a Odense company that now operates robots in Bilka that move things from A to B, even in the public areas. So that is a reality already now. Also now or very soon, I, don't, I hope that I don't see cleaning personnel anymore in five years uh, here at the university that is sitting on these machines. So I would expect also this uh, becomes solved. What I think is a good way or a good area to do research in are these kind of repetitive actions that occur. Here, for example, you could think about a coffee machine that kind of you, you are in a launch in, a, in, in an airport and it offers you, it makes kind of a communication with you, what kind of coffee with milk and so on and so on, and then it goes away. So these kind of repetitive actions where there are no hands involved, no complex manipulation is involved. This I see as a big possibility that, that these kind of robots will play a, a role in, in the near future. Everything that is connected with, uh, with dextrous grasping, I have difficulties to see that this will play a, a big role. And in, when, when you deal uh, in, in public spaces, you don't know what kind of objects you have to deal with, so you need to do dextrous grasping in some way. And this I would still see as, as, as pure science fiction. I think we are 100 miles away from, from that. Thanks a lot. <laughs> We have time for questions. 15 minutes. Yeah. I mean, garbage sorting has a problem that it's probably not so bad when you make a mistake, because it's not a very valuable uh, device or the valuable things you do. So when, when you can allow for, for errors, that's always convenient. So I, I could imagine that could be something where more complex hands also play a role, actually. Because there, you don't have this high demand like when you, uh, when you do a very exact manipulation afterwards. I, I think this one could imagine already happening now. I could imagine. I, in particular, you could still make it that it's maybe only 50% that you do in the beginning, and, and the, the rest of the 50% the, the rest of the 50 humans are still doing, and then you increase slowly. So I think that would be a very nice area where actually you could also integrate some learning. When it came to these kind of uh, finding the addresses of people on letters, I think it was similar. They started with machines where they have maybe still 50% that need to be hand sorted, but they created a lot of learning material, and, and then time after time they could actually uh, achieve something. Very interesting talk for somebody who's a humanist who works at, in history. Uh, uh, I have a question uh, co related to the use of sound in interaction between robots and machines. Who is doing the 
development of the sounds. And to, to give you, uh, to explain my, my question, I, I'll give you an example. Uh, my, my, one of my sons is Brazilian. In Brazil, people are loud. They speak loudly. He goes to school in Denmark, and here he's constantly being shh, shh, don't talk so loud. Um, there's a cultural component of the way we perceive of sounds, even these kind of small, yeah. smaller uh, yeah. symbolic sounds. Yeah. How uh, is that going to be developed? Is that going to be outsourced to, to specialists? And which, ki which kind of specialists? Yeah, I must say, I'm not a speech expert. So um, what I can say is, is, is a bit of, uh, first, this is one of the complexities of interaction. A robot that would talk all the time too loud to you, you would get annoyed. And that might be cultural differences. Also the closeness, I, I don't, I could imagine that in the, in the Mediterranean area, people coming are closer to each other than in Denmark where one keeps a certain distance and so on. And these are also things that need to be taken into account. How this is exactly, I'm, I'm, I'm sure there are sound designers and things like this. In, the, in one of the other uh, projects in Rethicare, we actually developed a, 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 a machine that cleans the floor and looks a bit like a cat to not scare the elderly people. And also there we worked with different kind of sound patterns. This is a, I, I think at the end you need to design and test. I think that's, that's how it is done. Uh, uh, with the latest leaps in uh, AI, the latest yeah. models here within the last half year, does that change your opinion on any of this is research from the last five years' time or? Yeah, I, I think in computer vision a lot happened. So there you have for specialized tasks, you, you get superhuman performance, breast cancer recognition, face recognition and so on. And it, 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 it started in, within 30 years, actually, face recognition was solved in some ways that I would not have imagined. Um, chat GDP is something that works purely on written language. Here, we have other issues. We want to touch objects, manipulate objects. And I think maybe there are people having other opinions we have still hardware constraints. So we have not understood the problem. And it's also more difficult to generate a lot of training data. You would need to have a lot of training data about how robots, you need to allow for a lot of failures. I mean, what, 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 what do you, would you be willing as a human to say, okay, yeah, I can live with some failures when, when, in Ruben, when a robot uh, permanently annoys you? So, I, th I think there are fundamental issues when it, when it comes to, to manipulation and uh, also to human-robot interaction. So this doesn't take it uh, back. Uh, so I would still, uh, but, but also these are not unsolvable problems. It's not, I mean, it, I, I'm sure that at some point there comes a hand, there comes a tactile sensor, there comes a control mechanism so that, that will impress us. Right, so uh, thanks, that was a nice talk, Norbert, and thanks for mentioning the drones along the way. Uh, and we already talked about, I think, one aspect of your talk about drones grabbing stuff, and yeah. I, I, it sounds like some of what you've already been doing, that could probably work there with all the horrible uncertainties and everything. Yeah. But then there's the human-robot interaction thing, and, and, and drones right now, that's like a huge angry wasp with a horrible sound, and it looks scary, that then wants to come close to you. Yeah. That's a really difficult problem. So, so what are we, if we want, so drones are already now getting into the public space. So it, it's a problem yeah. we have already now. And yeah. there you don't want, we're not talking about one meter di personal distance. Yeah. It's like 50 meters personal distance with a drone or, or maybe yeah. worse. So there are many problems there. How, what are we going to do in that area? It, we, I mean, your, all of your robots look so very friendly <laughs> compared to how one of, might perceive a drone that's, that flies in close and wants to hand you a cup of coffee very gently, uh, but also looks very scary. So how, how are we going to do the human-robot interaction problem there? Okay, let's, let's write a research broad. 
in, in, I see there, there are some more uh, uh, challenges. I mean, first you have something flying, and flying is maybe a bit more unstable than. Uh, then there might be also that you have associated, so drones are now used a lot in wars. You have these kind of asso uh, associations. Uh, I don't know, uh, it's important that you deal with the, yeah, that you can make them safe. Uh, and then I think it's a lot about design, also maybe working with the sound and, and things like this. Uh, but, but this one would need to look into. Uh, uh, I, I cannot more say to that. I think you have, you have the challenges we have, and you have some extra challenges there. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you for the really exciting talk. Um, you explained very nicely the importance of uh, visual perception for robots uh, and the lack of or good tactile sensors. And of course, we as humans have many um, sensory modalities, also hearing, and uh, to some extent process these multisensory. So they're multisensory areas in the brain that respond both to vision and hearing and so on. So to what sense are robots multisensory? That's a good question. Um, so vision is, I mean, I said more than half of our cortex is concerned with vision, but the sensor, is rather simple. I mean, rather, it's still a complex device, yeah? And, but we are able to, to develop cameras that are probably better than the human eye. Maybe not in terms of motion and so on, but I mean, in terms of resolution and so on, we, we, we are in terms of frequency, I mean, they're, they're 200 hertz or even more, something like this. So there, the complexity is actually, the, it's not the device anymore, but it's the processing. And also one, I mean, a lot of progress has been done in vision. Very often, once you put the, uh, the, the vision then into a robot scenario, then the vision is not so stable anymore. Anyway, um, but when you look, for example, at the skin, yeah, it's, it, I think it's, it's 10 kilogram of your body is skin. You have multiple, multiple tactile sensors in, in your skin. So there, and we, we are not able to do something of similar quality. So here the complexity is really in the device, the areas in the human brain where the processing is done, they are not so big actually. So it might be different there. So there might be the challenge on the, on the, on the sensor side similar with, with taste and with, uh, uh, with, with smell. I don't know much about research in these areas actually. So I, but I could imagine they are actually the, the, the problems are more on the sensorial side. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much. Very, very interesting. And well, I learned a lot, you know, not knowing anything about robotics. I think it was very, very interesting. Uh, coming from humanities, I would like to go back to what uh, was said before in terms of, yeah, so when you have robots that will involve some interaction with, with humans, you know, uh, you mentioned the loudness, you know, there can be difference, cross-cultural difference in terms of loudness, in terms of, you mentioned how close you can get to the other person who you're talking. Also, you know, how many um, um, turn taking, so how, you know, are you allowed to interrupt the other person when you're talking? Like in Spain, we interrupt a lot, for example. So whereas here, you know, there's these long pauses that you have to wait and it's almost embarrassing, but here in Denmark, it's okay. So my question is with all these differences, would this mean that it's hard to develop a, a robots that can work in different cultures, is that a no-go? I mean, does that mean that you know that you would have to tune uh, to different, um, yeah, more different types of people, you know, in cultures? Yeah, thank. You. I could I could imagine that this is required, uh, but that would be kind of the extra level on top. There now already, I mean, if you could just get one robot where it would work for, for, for Denmark, it would be already <laughs> nice. So, so, uh, but, but, but you're right, so that 
what probably would have a button Spain or, or something like this at some <laughs> point. But, but there are a lot of problems beforehand. So, uh, and that's, that's the general uh, problem that the, the media image of robots is so positive. So we, you, people think we can do so much, but at this talk the idea was a bit to say, I look, mm, we, we, can't, we can't do so much as you might think. Okay. Thank you. Last question. Yeah, uh, thank you for the talk. Um, so it was actually the same maybe question, just the other way around. Do you think there's a risk that we kind of get an Americanization where social robots are built for the American market, introduced in the rest of the world, and then we adapt the norms because these robots are not able to change, and then to actually interact with them, we all kind of learn that acceptable distance for the robot is one meter, and then that kind of forces the I, social interaction. So I, I, I don't believe that, uh, that the state is better than us in robotics. So I, I, I would say here Europe is strong enough to, to not need to adapt to, the, uh, uh, to what comes from the states. I, I think we are, we are really strong in, in, in robotics and also China and other countries. I mean, I, I think that is not, and it, I mean, you, you have Google and Facebook where then they get so dominant. That's probably what, what you think uh, was the motivation of your question. Um, I have difficulties, difficulties to see that in robotics, but of course you can always be surprised, but I, I have difficulties to see that. Great.